Hi, I'm Melissa Chalker, Executive Director of the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. Welcome to Aging Insights. Aging Insights is a production of the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. NJFA's mission is to improve aging in New Jersey and help older adults live in the community of their choice. Aging Insights is supported through sponsorships and viewer donations. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, please go to our website at www.njfoundationforaging.org or call us in the office at 609-421-0206 for more information. Today we'd like to talk about a specific population, LGBT older adults. We will review some history, policy changes, and the importance of inclusiveness and what providers can do to help. Our guest today has been working on these issues and has even conducted some research with seniors. Carolyn Bradley joins us today to review the obstacles, needs, and resources for this community. Carolyn, welcome and thank you for joining us on Aging Insights. We're really pleased to have you. Um, thank you for having me. If we could start out just by giving a little bit of brief introduction of yourself and the work that you do. I understand you're with Monmouth University, is that correct? Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Carolyn Bradley. I'm an Associate Professor of Social Work in uh, the School of Social Work at Monmouth. Uh, where I'm also the MSW program director. Uh, I have a doctorate in social work from uh, Fordham University, which is also where I got my uh, master's. Mm -hmm. And I've been faculty, full-time faculty at Monmouth for the last 14 years. And I understand through that uh, experience in, in, uh, in academics, you've done some research, which we'll get to at some point in the show. But if we could start out by explaining to our audience, because not everyone might be familiar, what mm -hmm. we mean when we say LGBT. Okay. Um, LGBT is an acronym, and it stands for uh, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender. Uh, so the community uh, has really experienced some challenges earlier on. Things are um, moving in a more positive direction at this point, both legally and socially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to explore that a little bit with you because as we talk specifically about older adults in that community, we have to understand the obstacles and needs of that community is really shaped by the history in our country mm -hmm. with, for this population. So could you tell us a little bit about what that struggle might have been like? Um, it's interesting that we're talking about this topic because mm -hmm. in June we'll celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots in New York, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in 1969, um, in June of 1969, the LGBT community um, really decided it was time to come out of the closet. And they did it in a very dramatic way um, by actually taking on the, the police who had come to uh, raid the Stonewall Bar mm -hmm. on Christopher Street in New York. And that has now uh, become a national historical site. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a park across from the Stonewall, which is still open, um, that commemorates that event. Prior to uh, the push for LGBT civil rights initiated uh, dramatically by uh, the Stonewall uh, riots, there had been um, smaller groups like the Madison Society, the Daughters of Belitis, um, who had also pushed uh, for recognition of LGBT uh, people as just that, people, mm -hmm. and not uh, pariahs, not mm -hmm. uh, part of society that should be excluded or discriminated mm -hmm. against. Stonewall brought that um, issue to the forefront very dramatically. Uh, since that time, we've seen gains in civil rights. Um, we've even seen gains within the uh, psychiatric and mental health community um, because up until the early 70s, uh, homosexuality was still considered a psychiatric disorder and people could be hospitalized, they could undergo um, shock treatment, they could undergo lobotomies in an attempt to try and change their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a long history of fear of the police, fear of what should be considered uh, helping organizations such as mental health and psychiatry mm -hmm. uh, within that community. And, you know, it's just as important as it is to recognize those leaders of those movements that brought about the social and political mm -hmm. change, policy change that you've talked about. Um, you know, it's also good to recognize, as we're going to talk about, that this really impacts the ability of older adults in this community to reach out for services because we have to view it through the lens of what they've experienced in their lives mm -hmm. because of those battles. Definitely, correct? definitely. Yeah. So, uh, again, as people age... Um, and they begin to recognize the need for some type of service, mm -hmm. uh, people of the pre-Stonewall generation, shall we call them, mm -hmm. um, remember um, those problems around discrimination uh, and 
the irony is the people that really pushed the closet door open are now going back into the closet as it's time to access services. Sure, and we, you know, we might not recognize as people who want to serve all older adults in our state or in mm -hmm. our community, we want to have our doors open for them and so we don't necessarily always understand that someone coming in from the LGBT community might be afraid to identify themselves as being part of that community because they're afraid of stigma or shame and so as you said they're reverting um, to go back in the closet. What are, what are some negative impacts of that upon them trying to access services in that frame? From the research, and uh, both national research done by SAGE, which is a, a national uh, advocacy group for older LGBT adults, and uh, the more local research that we did out of Monmouth, uh, what we found is it creates isolation. Mm -hmm. And it, it creates a delay in accessing services. Uh, where older adults in the heterosexual community um, might more willingly begin to look at, okay, maybe I, I need uh, some home health aid services, maybe I need to get somebody in to help me with cleaning. Mm -hmm. um, older LGBT adults will delay for as long as possible uh, because they are concerned about who's coming into my home, how will I be treated. Mm -hmm. Your home should really be your safest space, mm -hmm. okay? And um, from the stories we collected when we were doing the research, uh, LGBT older adults found if they didn't, you know, straighten up the house, mm -hmm. okay, um, put away pictures, mm -hmm. put away books, put away magazines, sometimes they were challenged by the people who were supposed to be actually providing them help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really interesting, and I want to, as we have our conversation, get into not only the research you've done, but also what providers can do to better train staff and mm -hmm. make sure that those sort of things don't happen. But before we get into that, I do want to make sure we talk about the civil rights um, changes and the policy changes that have occurred that you've, that you've already referenced. What are they and, and how have they had a positive impact on the LGBT community and older adults maybe more specifically? Um, New Jersey is really one of the better states to live in, okay? Um, if you're a older LGBT uh, adult, okay? <laughs> Um, th there's a, a lot of positive legislation here in New Jersey. Um, we've had a, a gay civil rights law in New Jersey for a while. There's a, a trans civil rights law mm -hmm. in New Jersey. So there are protections in terms of housing, accessing uh, care and services, things of that nature. Uh, nationally, the, the Marriage Equality Act uh, mm -hmm. certainly uh, created a better financial situation mm -hmm. for LGBT older adults. Mm -hmm. Um, but what we're watching, if you're paying attention, it is um, certain states enacting their own legislation. Uh, states like Texas just enacted legislation that says health care providers can deny care to LGBT people mm -hmm. on, uh, based on religious uh, beliefs. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, similar laws like that enacted uh, on a state-by-state -state basis throughout the United States. So we're watching a, a turn, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and that's something we're going to have to uh, pay closer attention to. Right, and just with any, um, you know, progress that we make mm -hmm. uh, for any community, we have to be very aware of where policy changes occur, and, and you know, and the fact that states have, you know, distinct policies they can make on their own. And yes. so it's important to, for, for advocates and others mm -hmm. to remain aware of what the rights are for people in, in each state and, um, and how we can help. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Uh, and so I appreciate you sharing that sort of sort of information with us and that that piece the of it. important thing, though, to re recognize, even though there is marriage equality, mm -hmm. um, a lot of pre Stonewall older adults choose not to get married because uh, they don't see that as, as a necessity within this particular community. Mm -hmm. um, younger people, people, um, you know, 60 or younger, you'll see more people in that age range possibly going for mm -hmm. marriage. So it, it still creates problems in, mm -hmm. in terms of if someone chooses not to get uh, married, then there are the um, issues around transfer of property, mm -hmm. okay, upon uh, death. There's issues in terms of access, uh, health care, in terms of who will make your decisions for you. Mm -hmm. um, so there are still, you know, legal issues for the older LGBT community. Uh, that often need to be explored with them in terms of advanced directives, um, power of attorney, making sure both names are on um, deeds for property that are jointly owned. 
Um, so it, it, it's it's not a, a clear cut issue. Yeah, and so you know, as we talked a little bit, um, you know, around the idea of healthcare and accessing, mm -hmm. you know, um, both psychiatric services as well as just in general social mm -hmm. services, we also have to remember kind of these legal issues. And you know, I think uh, it's important for any couple to to talk about and have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of work uh, on this show about educating people about how to plan for, um, you know, have healthcare proxies and advanced directives. And so that's so much, that's so important. But at the same time with the LGBT older adults, it's probably even more so important because of other legal issues for them to really understand what documents they should have and how they can protect themselves, correct? Well, yes, because if you don't have those documents in place and you're not married, mm -hmm. um, the person you may have lived with for uh, 25, 30 years who uh, loves you and who has cared for you is not going to be the person who makes those final decisions for you medically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it becomes a challenge. And yes. so uh, I hope that, um, you know, through this show, we can bring awareness to that, mm -hmm. but also that there are providers out there who are trying to reach this population and educate them about the available resources. Very much so, can. yes. Yeah. That's great. So as we, you know, as we think about the history and the, um, you know, the reluctance of people to seek services because of the history and the barriers that they face, um, what are, you know, and so let's, let's transition, I guess, to talk about your, your research specifically. Okay. So what is it that you've worked on research-wise with this community and, and how has it kind of made an, an impact on what we know? Okay. Um, we started out um, starting the LGBT Elder Adult Project at Monmouth University in uh, 2012 mm -hmm. and it was the result of having seen a documentary called Gen Silent mm -hmm. uh, which is I believe available now on YouTube and, and is very um, very well done very interesting mm -hmm. uh, and what we were looking at is that was shot in an urban area uh, it was shot uh, in the Boston area mm -hmm. so we were interested in seeing are the issues that they're uh, experiencing in an urban setting how do they play out in a more suburban area like Monmouth Ocean in Middlesex County which is where we conducted the research mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted to see if people were experiencing the same problems uh, in terms of how your sexual orientation influences the aging process mm -hmm. what are the similarities what are the differences mm -hmm. and uh, some of the things that we found were first of all the legal challenges mm -hmm. then we were looking at health care disparities that uh, does being uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender impact the uh, health issues that you experience? And is your care impacted by the lack of knowledge of healthcare providers around the uniqueness of um, being within that uh, sexual minority? Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the things we found was that, first of all, the community is unaware of the health uh, issues that are different based on sexual orientation, mm -hmm. and that there's little to no education uh, within the medical community around the uniqueness of LGBT health issues. Uh, when we were doing a training with a group of nurses, um, and we started the training, uh, and the nurses had been told that they were attending this, one of the first questions one of the nurses asked was, what does LGBT mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is uh, 2017, we were probably doing this training. Mm -hmm. um, so th that lack of awareness within the medical community mm -hmm. was really kind of um, shocking. Yeah. Um, the first study within the, the medical community of LGBT healthcare dispar disparities was in 2011. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and when they did that research, they said there is no body of knowledge. Uh, for this community mm -hmm. and that we're just starting to understand and there hasn't when you uh, really do a lit search there's not a, a lot that has really come forward since that time right. um, so part of it is educating both the consumer and educating the provider I think that's a really important piece that we want to make sure we cover both what, what consumers can do mm -hmm. um, to understand their rights and what providers can do to make people more comfortable in accessing services. Um, so with your research, um, you know, it really intrigues me that, you know, it resulted in training. And as I said, I want to cover that part. But how did you go about finding seniors to interview and what type of thing, sort of things did you ask them? Um, well, the first thing we did was go to the uh, Pride Festival. 
mm -hmm. in Asbury Park, which is always the first Sunday in June. Pride Festival is a, a, a gathering yes. of people in the LGBT community to come together and, and celebrate. And right. And in New Jersey, mm -hmm. it's always in uh, Asbury Park, the first mm -hmm. Sunday in, in June. Uh, so we went to the Pride Festival and we set up a booth and we tried to get people to uh, sign up uh, to give us a, a mailing list mm -hmm. that we could then access because we explained we were going to be doing uh, research. We were interested in gathering their opinions. Mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting. We had, um, you know, t-shirts that said LGBT Older Adult Project, had a big rainbow on them. Mm -hmm. um, and the lesbians would come up and sign up and they were very interested and they wanted to talk to us, mm -hmm. but we weren't getting very many gay men. So we had a um, BSW student with us who was a, a, a young gay man. And we said, you know, why don't you go out into the crowd with a clipboard, see mm -hmm. if you can get uh, people to give us some information. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know, he'd go out into the crowd. Uh, the lesbians would see him, would come up and be like, you know, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. We'll sign up. He was like, as soon as you started walking to a group of gay men, he was like, they went that way, okay? Yeah, and so it, it, it's interesting because you find that across the um, board in, in studies. Um, gay men are, are much less likely to acknowledge aging, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. And um, they're less likely to be prepared to age. Mm. Um, the lesbians will have, you know, their investment portfolio in place. <laughs> um, they've got their power of attorneys, mm -hmm. okay? They've got their living wills, they've got their wills, okay? Mm -hmm. Everything is in place. Um, the gay men are much less prepared, and so we were interested in trying to find out why. Mm -hmm. So we started asking that as a direct question, you know, what preparations have you made? If you have not made any preparations, can you share with us uh, why you have not? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of poignant. A lot of them uh, who were of that pre-Stonewall or just around Stonewall, um, said, I never thought I'd live this long because mm -hmm. all of my friends died in the epidemic. Mm -hmm. Okay? True. Uh, they lost so much of, of their social network to the AIDS uh, mm -hmm. epidemic mm -hmm. that they didn't think they needed to prepare. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more catch-up work to, done, to be done with the men. Yeah, and it's really interesting that you you started to learn things before you even started to ask the questions, Question. right? Just yeah. in trying to gather yeah. people to participate in the study, you yeah. were you were learning lessons. Just through observation, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, how come the women are, are so willing to come mm -hmm. forward and what's going on with the men? And did you learn anything surprising about the reasons behind reluctance to seek services that you, that you know, or, or did you really learn the things you expected to hear in that area? Um, in terms of the consumers, we learned what we thought we were going to learn. Mm -hmm. In terms of the providers, it was a little different. The consumers um, are concerned because of historically uh, how the community has been treated. And they're really worried that um, at the time that they're most vulnerable, as they age and they feel mm -hmm. less able mm -hmm. uh, to really care for themselves, are they going to be mistreated? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, with the providers, it's like there's this hidden population and nobody's even thought mm -hmm. um, that there's this group out here and that if they are out there, well, why are their um, needs any different from heterosexuals? Mm -hmm. And so, so in your research, you um, did a survey not only with consumers but also with providers. Mm -hmm. uh, and how was the process for seeking out providers? Did you find that there were any particular provider groups that were reluctant to participate? or? Well, first of all, um, you had to convince the providers there was a necessity to participate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we started out by having a graduate student uh, compile a list of uh, agencies serving older adults in Monmouth Ocean and Middlesex County, and those included senior centers, Department on Aging, home health care agencies, uh, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, any feeding programs in the area. Uh, and then we had the graduate student call and ask to talk to either an executive director or the director of, of social work services and ask three questions. Do you have any um, LGBT older adults um, that are consumers of your service? Mm -hmm. Do you have any LGBT uh, staff and do you have any LGBT specific services? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we were told no to all three questions. Wow. Okay. Um, and when we asked, you know, how do you um, know this, mm -hmm. um, they said, well, nobody's come forward to 
who, mm -hmm. um, you know, self-identify. Mm -hmm. And we asked, well, do, do you see a necessity of having either uh, specific services or uh, staff trained mm -hmm. or out staff? And the, the response was, no, we treat everybody the same. I was going to say, did you, do you think it was a result of the providers feeling like, well, anybody can come here, everybody comes here, you know, and not a need to have them identify themselves? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that, that's like saying, I don't see color. Right. Okay. Because yeah. I, I then miss a whole um, significant part of that person's life experience. Mm -hmm. And I deny that that person's experience is any different. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, to me, it shows a lack of understanding mm -hmm. uh, of how certain characteristics of, over which you have no control mm -hmm. uh, define the experience that, that you have. And so, as a result, obviously, you've, uh, there's been instituted some training yes. opportunities for providers. Did you find that people were willing to participate in those, or did it take some convincing? Um, actually, no. <laughs> for the most part, since we were offering it mm -hmm. uh, for free, mm -hmm. um, that you know, the university was basically underwriting the mm -hmm. cost. Mm -hmm. um, most of the agencies that we offered it to were like, sure, okay. And so what kind of um, things did you go over in the training? What type of points do you give providers on how to, to better accept this population? We've developed a sensitivity um, training curriculum. Mm -hmm. It can be delivered in an hour and a half, three hours, or we can do a six-hour training. Mm -hmm. um, and what we look at is uh, what we call um, you know, LGBT alphabet one, okay? Mm -hmm where we go over what each of the letters, um, and we'll expand that out when we do it. So it'll be LGBTQ plus, mm -hmm. okay, and go over all of that. Mm -hmm. Then we'll look at the history of the community and, and why the community uh, is unique. Mm -hmm. And then we go over the issue of healthcare uh, disparities, what you need to know, what you need to look for, what are the questions mm -hmm. that need to be asked. Then we, um, look at the uh, legislation, mm -hmm. the, the civil rights issues, mm -hmm. the, the uh, current legal issues, which is changing on a daily basis, state mm -hmm. by state. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we really spend time saying, okay, um, let's look at your agency's policies and procedures. Let's look at your forms. Mm -hmm. How do you um, give a signal that this is a safe place? Mm -hmm. um, because people aren't going to disclose if they don't feel right. uh, that they're safe. Mm -hmm. And what are some ways then that providers can make themselves known as someone who's going to be sensitive? Or it, it, it's really very simple. I mean, it's as simple as putting a pride flag on your website. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as showing um, same-sex couples, you know, sitting together, mm -hmm. uh, where all you see are pictures of heterosexual couples. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, is there any room for me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you look at the forms, recognize that not everyone is going to be married, so you could put partnered on your form. Mm -hmm. Okay, so th there's very simple things. When we do the longer training, we ask people, bring some of your uh, agency paperwork and let's talk about what your agency has. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, really great, and I think, you know, oftentimes it's not so much that providers aren't willing to be inclusive and to make people comfortable, but they're just not aware. And so the fact that training is available, mm -hmm. I think, is, is really an important part of it. Um, but not only can providers do things, but consumers themselves. So what things would you like for LGBT older adults watching to know that they can do as consumers to um, protect their rights and understand what their rights are? Well, uh, there's a couple things. One of the first things is trying to understand the importance of letting your um, health care provider know who you really are. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And when we were collecting um, stories, some people have had really bad experiences with that, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, when they did come out to their doctor, their doctor immediately put gloves on. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or um, told a lesbian about um, how high risk she was for HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, there is HIV and AIDS in the community, but in the lesbian community, the percentage is very low. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the ignorance of the medical community. Right. And the fact that he might not have educated any woman coming to him about that versus someone who identified right. as a lesbian. Yeah. Right. And if you had on your uh, intake form a question about sexual orientation, then um, you might be less likely to ask that person, a, a, a lesbian, about what are you using for birth control? Okay, which, which is often, 
you know, uh, for a lesbian, that's like, okay, that's a really difficult question because it already tells me you don't really understand me, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's looking at those kind of issues, but it, it's trying to get the community to um, be more forthcoming in who they are and demanding that uh, regardless of what my sexual orientation is, I deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And if, if they're not, then um, being willing to take it up the complaint ladder, mm -hmm. okay? Advocate for yourself in those situations. And because New Jersey has um, civil rights laws, it, it's a uh, safe place to actually try and do that. I think that's uh, a, a great place for us to end mm -hmm. in, in letting our audience know that you should always be a self-advocate and always um, look out and, and understand what your rights are and, and to seek that information out. Mm -hmm. It's out there in the public, right? Yes. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you, Carolyn, for joining us. Really appreciate the information that you've shared with us today. Thank you. And thank all of you for watching this episode of Aging Insights. Uh, for more information and to watch previous episodes, please go to our website at www.njfoundationforaging.org and click on our Aging Insights page. Aging Insights is produced by the New Jersey Foundation for Aging and is made possible by sponsors and donations from viewers like you. To become an Aging Insights sponsor, please go to our website or call us in the office at 609-421-0206. And to find out about senior services in your area, please contact your county office on aging. Their numbers can also be found on our website, or you can call the state hotline at 1-877-222-3737. Thank you for watching, and be sure to tune in next time.